There we go. Okay, and so I pulled up the and what I call here, you know, session five, if you like, uh, which started on Tuesday. So now this is extending into today. We'll finish it today, I hope. Um, we're looking at logical statements in processing. And you remember, we looked at logical statements when we were talking about Excel. We had if statements. And uh, in Excel, we used if statements uh, to make our Excel spreadsheets more interesting. We could check to see if values let's say we're greater than or less than something or equal something and depending on that we could execute a, uh, a special command and uh, same thing in in processing in the processing language and indeed uh, i guess i'm not aware of any computer language that does not have these logical statements if if then if then else um true false typically they deal with with booleans but you, know, you don't absolutely need to have booleans but it but it checks to see if a statement is true or false if a statement is true one block of code is executed if a statement is false a different block of code is executed which is basically the way these logical statements go so we were looking at these uh, these statements. We were looking at uh, the position of the mouse, mouse X and mouse Y. And depending on the position of the mouse, if the position of the mouse was such that the X value was within a certain range and the Y value was in a certain range, let's say if the position of the mouse were over a button, um, then we might uh, have the program do something. Or if we, the last piece of code we looked at, we looked at if the position of the mouse were over a button, and if we press the mouse, then then the the program did something. So that's basically a mouse press, which you do all the time on your phone. All the time you're going to something, and then you're you know, pushing a button on the screen and then something happens. So m pressing a m mouse button is, uh, is an essential part of what we currently do in any piece of software. So we are looking at how you might implement uh, pressing a button in a piece of processing code. Now we're going to um, continue to extend these applications of uh, if then else statements. So we're moving away for the time being from just pressing a button. Uh, this ne next example looks at, let's say, bouncing a ball off the sides of the window, which is uh, something that uh, that uh, I did in the uh, when I showed you the example of the Pong game, how we had a ball bounce off the sides of a window. So let's investigate how that piece of code works. Um, oh, before I get into that, if, lest I forget, um, you know, we're rapidly coming up actually into the end of the semester. I think classes probably end in, in about a month, so you know, four weeks. Um, and I'm planning on, on giving uh, a take home final. So I didn't do a midterm, uh, but we had the project in Excel. This basically functioned as a midterm. And uh, uh, the, so I'm going to give a take home final. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a sample final a week or so before, and then have you, let's say the last week of class, um, turn in, I, I will you give you the final, uh, you will have, let's say most of that last week to do it, and then you turn in the results, and then 
uh, that'll be it. That won't have an in-class final. And um, so I'll give you a sample final, give you some idea what kinds of questions I'm going to ask. You should look at that. If you look at that, you should be in excellent condition uh, for doing the take home final. But in addition to giving you that sample final before the exam, I will, um, as far as doing the questions on the take home final, I have no restrictions. In other words, you can go online, you can look for things in Google, uh, you can chat back and forth with people. Uh, the only thing I am asking is that you, in the end, you submit your own work. You just don't copy something that someone else uh, did or told you to do and send it in that you know, even though you may learn how to do something by looking online, that you actually, you know, type in that program yourself and send it because I'm of the um, belief after years and years and years and years and years and years and years of teaching that um, the only way people learn things is by doing them. And even things that just seem to be kind of um, just a stupid exercise uh, in in doing something you learn from. Uh, the value actually of in the old days, a uh, professor would come in and give a lecture and you would take notes as a student. The value in taking notes is forcing you to write things down and, you know, for reasons uh, that I'm not expert in, uh, the way the, the brain works and the way we remember things and learn things, even writing down, that act of writing something down serves as doing something that helps us remember. So I, uh, what I have found over the years is just memorizing stuff before an exam and then doing it is a way to help you remember things for a few days, but in a few weeks or a few months, you will have forgotten everything. And um, what was it the great psychologist B.F. Skinner said that education is what we're left with after we've forgotten everything we've learned and um, something like that. That may not be exactly right. So, yeah, what I'm what Can I, I ask you something, so. Uh, sure, you can. Um, so um, you said that we will be having take home assignment, right? As our final exam. Right. So how much time uh, will you be given? Uh, you, well, uh, I'm planning on giving you a week. The last oh, week thank of class. You so much. The last week of class. And uh, well, you can say thank you. I mean, um, I'll give you an example of one of my experiences when I was a student. I uh, I was in graduate school, and there was a uh, I think I was in my second year of graduate school, and I was taking a very challenging course in mathematics. Uh, and it was called Real Analysis and Measure Theory. And um, that course, if you, you learned about calculus, real analysis is uh, like a completely different theory behind how calculus works. You know, normally you're, you, you're learning calculus by doing uh, limits of differences or limits of of uh, uh, for areas or things like that. And real analysis is a completely different concept and theory behind calculus. And uh, it's a it requires a sophisticated thinking. And I can remember that I uh, when I took that course, uh, there were two kinds of students in the course. There were honors, math, undergraduates 
and this was this was at Princeton, and so these math undergraduate students were all like geniuses, right there. Um, and um, then there were electrical engineering graduate students, which is were the category that I was in. And, um, and we weren't used to thinking about mathematics in these new ways, whereas the undergraduate math students were. They had sort of taken previous undergraduate courses and and that led up to it, and uh, I hadn't. So I can remember that we had when I had we had a we had an in class test for this undergraduate course, and um, my first test I got a C minus C minus, uh, and um, you know in, in graduate school then at that time I mean getting a C was like getting an F. And uh, so it was really demoralizing. And uh, I was having a lot of difficulty trying to grasp these new methods and techniques and concepts. And I was basically working my ass off trying to learn this stuff. And then gradually, as the semester went on, I kept doing better and better and better. So I was learning it. Then what, what happened and back then, I remember there are semesters. Uh, there uh, were uh, were twelve weeks, and they had a a big big winter break, similar to what you had. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, similar to what you have there at UCA, a big winter break, and uh, so there was a many several weeks in that winter break, and the. Pr Professor, math professor gave us a take home exam and had five questions on it, only five questions. And we have like five weeks to do this exam. You would think, wow, there's all this time. It took me the entire five weeks working hard every day. And indeed, there was uh, one part of one problem where I spent about 90% of my time on. It was really difficult. And uh, I worked hard and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. And then at the end of my five weeks, I had my take home exam uh, finished and I had like over 20 pages. And almost all of that space was on part of one problem that took most of my time. And um, then I turned it in and uh, I got an A in the exam. I was the only one in the class who got that part of that one problem right. And I, so I got the highest grade on the final exam. The only one who got part of one problem right. And because of that C minus that I had on that first exam, I still didn't get an A in the class. I, I thought that was grossly unfair. I thought I really deserved an A. And uh, and I worked that whole five weeks on that take home exam. So uh, just because I'm giving you a week doesn't necessarily mean it's all going to be easy. Although I, I'll tell you, I'm not planning on making it difficult. I mean, the, like I said, the purpose for me for having you do this take home exam is for you to go through the exercise of actually writing some things down and it's in that process that you learn what's going on. So uh, I'll have to get on this. I already started working on um, the exam. Yeah. Question. So you mm -hmm. will. Uh, yes. Um, so you will give us a sample assignment before the exam as well, right? That's right. OK. And um, so uh, I'm, you know, I'm not even quite sure now. Um, what the calendar is because they came out with a calendar and I put together my syllabus and then they revised the calendar and delayed the start of class by a week. So I'm not quite sure um, what my how my my um, my syllabus aligns with the current calendar. So I'm going to have to follow up on that. But my intention is the last week in class 
I'll give you the take home. So when during finals week, you don't have to worry about doing the take home exam. You will be finished. The week before the last week of class, I expect you to work on and turn in the take home final. And then before that, I will give you a sample. And um, the sample will be very, very similar to uh, to the uh, actual final. In fact, many questions on the sample might be identical to questions on the final. I've been known to do that. You see, the, the whole purpose and the process in my mind is just to have you do some things because as I said, it's in the process of doing that you learn. Now, let me get back on to these questions here. See if I can get through and get finished with them today on this section five. So let me uh, let me run the code on this example. It's not that long. I hope you can see here. So bouncing ball. It's not a very long piece of code at all. And uh, so let me run it. So here we see a ball. You see, and we see this ball bouncing off the sides, going back and forth. Now, if you look very carefully, you may notice something. You may notice if you look at the edge of the ball, the edge actually goes past the edge of the graphics window. And the ball actually bounces when the center of the ball hits the side of the graphics window. So if you're actually going to do this, I guess you could leave it like that because people may not even notice that that's happening. But you may want to make it so it's the perimeter of the ball that bounces off the window. So here I might ask you how you would change the code to make it so the perimeter of the ball rather than the center bounces off the side of the window. So for example, a question on the final, I may ask you to look at this piece of code, which I'm talking about now, and, and I'll send you uh, after class, and then ask you to look at this piece of code and say, how would you change it to make the uh, ball bounce off of the perimeter, the edge of the ball, rather than the center of the ball? Now, let me go over the code, and maybe that'll become pretty clear here. I'll just close this so it's not distracting you. OK, now we have, um, we're setting in two integers right in the beginning before even void setup. Integer x equals 0, integer speed equals 2. As you might imagine, as we increase the value of speed, the ball will move faster. We set up the size of our graphics window here. Set the background of the graphics window to be white, background 255. Now, this is in void draw. Notice I'm resetting the background inside void draw. If you remember, if I don't reset the background, what happens is there's sort of a residual image of the ball that follows uh, for example, I could comment out the background inside void draw and then run it. And you see, so it's not refreshing the window every time through, which is so the new every time through the draw, the old image stays in place and it draws a new image on top of the old image, is what's happening there. So, and notice too. The background 255, the background isn't white anymore because I commented that out. It's that default gray value. There we go. Now, so we add the current speed to the X location. So every time through void draw, it takes the old value of X, adds speed to it, and puts that into the new value of X. So every time through void draw, the value of X, which would presumably be the X position of the center of the ball, the value of X um, increases. So every time through, we change the X position. 
which is how we get the ball to move. OK, now uh, I don't haven't done this before yet. Two vertical lines. We've done two ampersands. Where we had and and vertical lines is the logical for or two ands. If I had ampersand ampersand, that's and but two vertical lines is or. So what, what am I saying here? If we have if statement, if X is greater than with or X is less than zero. So what this is checking to see is the value of X inside the graphics window. Remember, the graphics window goes from zero to width. So up here, width is 480. So X, is, if X looks like it's going outside the center of the ball, looks like it's going outside the graphics window, then we execute a piece of code. OK, so as long as X is inside the graphics window, this piece of code right here, from here to here, because I click here, and then this one, also highlight. So this is the block that gets executed if this if statement is true. So if this if statement is true, where x is greater than with or x is less than zero, we change the sign on speed. So here, when we do x equals x plus speed, if speed is positive, we're increasing the value of x each time through. So the ball's moving to the right. But if speed is negative, and we take x plus speed, we're actually making the value of x, the new value, smaller. So that causes the ball to move to the left. So this is what makes the ball bounce by changing the sign on speed. The ball's moving right, and then it hits the edge of the window. The value of speed changes sign. Why? because we're multiplying it by negative one. It changes sign. So then the value of X starts to decrease. The ball moves to the left. And then when we start to, when we go outside of the window, so X is less than zero, then we change the sign on speed again by multiplying by negative one. So we, uh, this statement right here changes speed from going to the right, to the left, and then to the right. So this is if statement is what makes the ball move right, then left, then right, and appear to bounce off the sides of the graphics window. So that's all happening right here. Now, um, so X is the X position of the center of the window. Let's go down here. Display circle at X location. So stroke zero, so we're making the perimeter of the circle black. We're filling the circle with gray. The center of the circle is at X, Y equal 100. And the diameter, the X diameter is 32 units. The Y diameter is 32 units. So this draws the circle with the X being the X coordinate of the center of the circle. So the X coordinate of the center of the circle changes by speed each time through draw. So you might, I'm, I'm suggesting, I haven't added this question to the exam, but if I did, like I said, it, it seems to me it would be a perfectly, I think a good question to ask you. Now you see the ball bounces when the center of the circle hits the edges of the window, how might you change this little code in here to make it so uh, the right edge of the circle hits the right edge of the window, it bounces, and then the left edge of the circle hits the left edge of the window, it bounces. So I might ask you to think about that. And, and, and uh, so you see the following here, Right in here is where we change the sign of speed. Right here is where we change the sign of speed. So that's how we get that 
ball to appear to bounce off the sides. Now in the pong game, rather than have the ball simply go left to right, what I did was I launched the ball at an angle. So I gave it, I changed not only the X coordinate, but the Y coordinate. And uh, I could change the Y coordinate here. The, the ball doesn't bounce yet. There's no code to make it bounce off the top and the bottom. So a different question might be to ask you to change this code so the ball moves up and down and bounces off the top and bottom. So that could be a question that I ask. Um, and uh, so you see, I could take this one piece of code and ask you to make several different small modifications to it. And in order to make those modifications, you'd have to have some idea how the code operates. So, um, uh, so that's an example of uh, what I might do. I, and then I, um, so I'm, now, depending on how much you've been paying attention as we're going along here, um, it, it might be easier or more challenging for you to make these changes because, you know, not everybody gets this programming uh, as quickly as everybody else. However, um, and, and I know that because I frequently jump into using a programming language when I know absolutely nothing about it. That's the way I've jumped into uh, Java when I first learned Java. I knew nothing about it and just jumped in and started using it. And, and actually, I, I found it really challenging uh, and for several reasons. Uh, and one of them is because Java has been around so long and there are so many different ways of doing the same thing in Java. And uh, so I'd look at old pieces of code to give me some idea on how to write a new piece of code. And one piece of code would do it one way and another piece of code would do the same thing in a completely different way, which confused me until I began to realize um, you know, that Java had built into it different ways of doing the same thing, which is almost always true. Almost always in, a, in, in writing code, there are different ways of doing exactly the same thing. And uh, so, okay. So this is... I have a question. Yeah. It's not really related to the topic. I just, I wanted to know... Uh, how to be consistent when learning programming? Because I was a computer science student, uh, like uh, since my prep year. But then, when we were learning Python, people said that it was easy, the easiest programming language. But when we were learning, I uh, couldn't focus. I was struggling, and I I was not consistent enough. So I just switched to another, like to communications and media. And now that we're learning processing, it's also uh, kind of reminds me of Python code. That's why like, uh, it's good, it, uh, processing is interesting, but the thing is that I'm again, uh, kind of um, starting to uh, be inconsistent when learning this uh, language. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by consistent. Could you uh, uh, explain that a bit more? I mean, like uh, when learning how to code even the simplest things, I it just becomes uh, more boring. Like I lose my concentration or get distracted easily. How do I keep myself working hard to try and learn uh, this uh, programming language? Okay, um, well, I, the only thing I can tell you is, uh, I guess, what, what I do. And um, I don't consider myself to be a great programmer. Um, you know, back many years ago, um, I learned uh, BASIC and FORTRAN, and programming uh, was completely different. It didn't have many of the features 
that that programming languages have today. And uh, I don't know that I ever really learned how to use all those new features. I mean, I I kind I kind of jump in without knowing something, and then kind of muddle through it. So what do I do? There's something I don't understand. I don't know if this is. You say you get you get bored with it because it's easy, or you get bored with it uh, because you're you're uh, having a problem doing something. But I just give up. Like I'm not persistent enough. Oh, persistent. Okay. Well, um, what what I do when I get to the point of uh, of giving up, um, well, don't tell anybody this. But what I do is I give up. I stop working on it. I take a break. Um, and um, and um, so I get stuck. And, and it kind of depends, I think, on how interested you are or focused or dedicated you are on trying to solve the problem. If you're not that dedicated in trying to solve the problem, uh, you give up and you won't go back, which is what a lot of people do. If you're not interested in something, you probably should move on to something else, which is sounds like that's what you did. But uh, for me, I sometimes get myself into a situation where I'm not, I don't give myself a, an easy option to give up. I'm trying to learn how to do something for some other reason. And that other reason is very important to me. Um, so I, uh, what I do is when I just get, my brain gets tired, I'm just tired of looking at something. What I used to do when I was a graduate student, I'd be working at my desk and there'd be something I just couldn't get, I just couldn't get it. And that would usually happen in the middle of the afternoon. And uh, I would just put my pencil down and I'd get up and I'd go for a walk around campus for 40 minutes or so. And I'd come back and I was refreshed. Uh, and it made a big difference. Now, now, you know, in years now looking back, when I went on these walks around campus, Frequently, I would see this fellow who looked like he was a homeless person. He was dressed in old, worn clothes and and uh, kind of looked weird. And, and uh, so from time to time, I would see this old guy, usually near the library. And I remember I'd walk by and I'd look at this guy sort of walking and I think, boy, what, what's he doing here, you know? And, um, and then I would go on. It was years later when I learned that that guy was John Nash. You may not know who John Nash was. He won a Nobel Prize in economics. Um, and... Um, uh, there was a movie made about John Nash called A Beautiful Mind. You may have heard of it. With Russell Crowe played John Nash. So I didn't know who this weird guy was. Like I said, he looked homeless. And, you know, and I, I would just be curious and wonder, who is this guy? I see him here all the time. Um, is he affiliated with the university? You know, he was sufficiently different from everyone else. And um, so, um, you know, you'd be surprised. Uh, you, I, you know, I would try to get my mind out of working on, on the problem that was giving me so many challenges. Go for a walk, mind, and then I'd come back and I'd be completely refreshed. Today, I do that. I get. I give up. I, you know, put things down. And um, but um, what I have found, and I sold this to you guys previously. I have found actually 
if I'm trying to solve something, there's almost nothing that I'm doing for the first time. Someone else has done it before me in programming and in anything else, whether it's math or any other, or, or you know, using Photoshop or whenever I get stuck and can't do something, I almost always find a video related to it on YouTube. So I would type in a question. Um, how do we, uh, I might actually type in something specific. How do we make an object bounce in the graphics window in processing? Something like that. And to my surprise, there'll be, um, uh, I'll get links to it in YouTube. And uh, almost always I can find what I'm looking for in YouTube. And I like the YouTube videos because when people go through a YouTube video, they're, they're actually, they actually go through the process of writing the code and showing it to you. Whereas if you just uh, pull up a text page in Google, they explain something that often is not clear to me. So I do YouTube or Google, but I've usually found YouTube to be more helpful than just doing it in Google. So when I get, when my brain stops working on something, I stop and I take a break. Now, this might be discouraging for you. The next thing I'm going to say is that sometimes I can't, I can't right away. Uh, sometimes it takes me days, weeks, and I kind of joke about it, where I've had years like that. What I mean is there have been times I've been trying to solve a particular problem, and I've been trying to, I try to solve that problem for years before I eventually get a solution. And uh, in fact, when, uh, again, as uh, back when I was really an active professor, which I'm, I'm not now, right? Um, and I was doing a lot of research and I got funding from outside sources to do research. And I would usually work on two completely different things at one time. So that when I got entirely tired and bored and uh, on one thing, and I had a problem I couldn't solve, I would put it down and I would switch to work on something else. And I'd work on that something else, that second thing, until I got tired and bored and overwhelmed with that and go back to the first thing. And often when I went back to the first thing, my brain was com sufficiently refreshed on that topic that I could jump in and quickly solve the problem that was confounding me before. So um, that's how I think, if that's the issues that you're running into, that's how I dealt with it. And, um, and everybody has those kinds of issues. As I have mentioned once before, uh, Albert Einstein, when he was working on the general theory of relativity, the special theory, he worked through fairly quickly. And actually, the special theory of relativity is not that difficult if you actually take some time to try to go through it. Uh, the general theory, on the other hand, he didn't have the tools that he needed to solve the problem. So he'd work on it, and then he'd kind of stop and he'd go out and he'd talk to people to try to see if someone else had any ideas and then he'd go back and work on it again and several times he thought he might have had it worked out and it turns out he didn't now i actually have a suspicion and it's kind of hinted at in some of his biographies that in the final push the final problem he was running into that he didn't know how to solve, and he was going out and giving talks. It was um, mathematical techniques that he that he didn't have, 
And there was a famous mathematician by the name of David Hilbert who looked at what he was doing and Hilbert thought, I know how to solve this. And it's speculated that Hilbert actually solved that last, in my mind, I speculate, that Hilbert actually solved that last thing and gave it to Einstein. Um, I think that may have happened. So what I'm saying is that even Einstein runs into these difficulties that he can't solve. And um, so we all do our work. We're all standing on the shoulders of the people who went before us. And so don't be afraid of trying to search around, finding how other people may have addressed similar problems. When you just can't, when you get stuck and can't move on, stop. Do something else, take a break, and then come back. I, I may have mentioned to you, uh, again, when we were doing Excel, that I don't know about four or five years ago, I was trying to learn something called the spigot algorithm. And to me, that was very challenging and new. There were, it was new ways of doing computations that I had never done before. And uh, I was having great difficulty reading the original paper on the spigot algorithm, which was published in the 1990s. And um, so I would work on that, trying to figure it out. And I just couldn't understand what was going on. And I would take a break and I would go back and work on it some more. And every time through, I made just a little bit more progress. It took me about six weeks to go through the beginning papers, the two, and they were simple papers. They weren't deep. I was just having a hard time understanding them. It took me about six weeks to learn the spigot algorithm uh, about five years ago. So, I mean, if you're having challenges on things, um, that's normal. As I would tell my students, uh, again, when, you know, back when I was a really active professor back at Purdue, uh, I had teaching undergraduates and graduate students and, and a lot of students. And I would tell them it's supposed to be difficult. If, if it were easy, then anyone could do it. And anyone can't do it, but you don't give up. You work on it and you take a break and you go back and try again. And sometimes you have to do this several times. Hopefully, in studying for a course, you don't just get stuck for weeks at a time. If that happens uh, and you don't go for help for the professor or somebody, for another student, I mean, you need to ask for that kind of help. But um, I would frequently be working on things that I, I didn't know who else understood it. And uh, so I don't know. I spent a lot of time. I'm almost actually out of class, out of time for class today. So I guess we'll have to come back on this next week. Um, but um, I hope that that addresses your question. It's yes. Thank you very much. I was just asking because uh, in the final exam, I may be stuck in solving these problems. Yeah, but like I said, I don't know if I made that clear and you may not be used to this. Um, it's OK with me. You go out and you use whatever resources are available, and it, that could be asking someone for help. OK, so. You could go online, you could go to friends, you could go to other students, and that, you know, if there's something that you don't know, this is your education, you're supposed to be learning how to do stuff. And so, and for me, it's completely okay for you to go out and find help. That's how you learn things, is you, something you don't understand, you ask for help from someone, whether you find it online or ask a person. That's how you learn. And that's how you're going to learn for the rest of your life. 
So learn how to ask for help. And uh, so I'm giving you these things, giving you the sample quiz, so you can look at the kinds of questions I might ask. I'm giving you a week to do the take home. So I'm giving you time to try to ask for help and solve things that you don't know how to do. Uh, I'm not trying to make it so difficult that you cannot do it, okay? I'm trying to make it so that you understand enough so that with a little help, you can you can solve it. Maybe you can solve it easily. So uh, it's okay to try to get help. I'm just asking that in the end, when you write down your code, you write down your own line by line piece of code before you send it back to me. Even if you're copying it, I want you to write it down line by line because that is how you learn things by doing it. Okay, now. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, um, okay. Uh, I think I'll, I could I'll do one more question here. Let me close this. So we were bouncing a ball there. Here's another piece of code. Bouncing color. Well, let's just look at this first, run it, and see what it does. Okay, so here I say bouncing color, but maybe uh, you see we have the we have two sections of our graphics window, and they're switching, alternating between red and blue back and forth. So you might see why I'm calling it bouncing color. And uh, so rather than bouncing a ball, I'm bouncing color. And uh, so let's look at this piece of code here. Let me close this now. OK, two variables for color. I have C1 is 0 and C2 is 255. So black here and white are the initial values. And they're floating point variables. Although they're 0 and 255 are integers, I'm setting these variables so that they can have decimal parts, fractional parts. Now, start by incrementing C1. So I begin here, I call you know, C1 was 0, and I'm defining another variable I call C1 change, which is 1. And now I start by decrementing C2. I have another C2 change was set to be minus one. So as you might imagine, I might take C1 and add C1 change, which increases the value of C1. And maybe if I take C2 and add C2 change to it, it decreases the value of C2, which is why I'm calling this decrementing. And this is incrementing. Now I do void setup. I set up the graphics window. OK, no stroke. OK, now what does no stroke do again? Is that that's not drawing um, boundary around. Is that what it's doing? You, know, you might verify that. Now I'm filling. Remember red, green, blue. So here's red, here's blue. And you see what's happening is C1 is telling me what the red value is. So I begin with C1 equals zero. OK, so zero and then C2 is 255. And then I draw. So here's red, green, blue, the initial values for C1 and C2. I'm drawing a rectangle. So this rectangle is probably half of the window, OK? And it uh, looks like the X dimension here, 240, is half of that. Um, so draw rectangle left. So this is drawing the left rectangle. Draw rectangle right. Notice that these colors are C2, C1. Where this was C1, C2. This is C2, C1. So I'm kind of flipping these two colors. 
I'm drawing the other half of the rectangle. And then I do C1 equals C1 plus C1 change. C2 equals C2 plus C2 change. So that's how I'm changing the colors. Now, here, say, here, let me make this one. Instead of reaching the edge of the window, these variables reach the edge of the color. Zero for no color, 255 for full color. When this happens, just like with the bouncing ball, the change is reversed. So what's going on here? Reverse direction of color change. I say if C1 is less than zero, right? Because the, the darkest the color can be is black, which is zero. So C1 is less than zero, or this is an or statement, or C1 is greater than 255, what am I going to do? I'm going to change C1 change. C1 change, this is times equal negative one. Now, times equal negative one. This is taking, this is a, this is a, a common way of doing things um, in many computer languages. What I'm doing, what this means, is I'm taking the old value of C1 change, multiplying by negative one, and putting it, putting the new value back into C1 change. So that's, this is the same thing. Let me make a comment here and write out what I just said. So here's a comment. This is the same thing as doing C1 change And setting it equal to C1, C1 change times negative one. Okay, so this is taking the old value of C1 change, multiplying by negative one. I put a space in here. In Python, you have to be careful putting in spaces because Python doesn't use curly brackets, if you remember. Um, now, C1 change equals C1 change times negative one. So I take the old value of C1 change, multiply by negative one, put it in the new value. So that's exactly what this means. So it's a different way of doing the same thing. So as I told you, in programming languages, there are frequently many different ways of doing the same thing. Now, what happened when the print language was first developed, this was probably the only way of switching the sign on a, on, a, on a variable, was do this. So here we're just changing the sign. If this is negative, this makes it positive. If this is positive, multiplying by negative one makes it negative. But then this occurred so many times as people were writing code that they put in a new statement in the language that sh that was a shorthand way. If you like, you know, you have this and when you're studying languages, you know, you have you have many different ways of saying the same thing. Some of them are more compact than other ways. And uh, and then and then if you're you know familiar with using the language, usually you use the compact way of saying it, the contraction rather than the long way. Uh, you say don't rather than do not. So think of this as similar to a contraction in a spoken language. Except if you're not aware of this, first time you see it, you'll think, what the hell does that mean? So this is what's this doing. We're saying if the value of C1 goes out of bounds, we want to change the sign on C1 change. Okay. And then the same thing happens down here with C2. So we're using the same technique that we did in the bounce, except here we're just swapping the colors, uh, making them go in different directions, if you like. So here we got this again so you can see it. Then when this exceeds to completely bright red, the sign changes, okay, and the red dims and the blue increases. 
and the reverse thing happens over here. So we're just bouncing the colors back and forth here. OK. Uh, I'm looking at my watch here. Yep. OK, so I guess this is about as far in this as I'm going to get today. Um, so, I'm, you know, before next week, I may go in and make some changes, uh, uh, add some things to this sample uh, test that I'm uh, working on, uh, may add some of the things I was just talking about before I forget it. OK, so here we've done a bouncing ball. Here we're doing bouncing color. And um, so uh, I, I think that'll be it. I'll go back to the faculty meeting if it's still going on. Um, so I mean, anybody have any questions about this particular example before I uh, go back to my uh, camera? Okay, I'll go back to my camera here. No questions so far. Okay, so um, yeah, I finished with that example. I'm going to go back to the faculty meeting and I'll finish this lesson five next week and start lesson six. And um, so, you know, we're we're doing these logical statements. Now, what did you learn today that you we haven't used before? You've learned that the two vertical lines are the logical or. We know that the two ampersands are the logical and. Now we see what logical or is. So um, uh, uh, that's uh, that's all I have to say now. Um, Thank you. Have a nice day. OK, I will. You Thank too. Thank you. Uh, yep. Thank you. Stop recording.